So we've uh, uh, progressed uh, to this point um, uh, over the last uh, 40 years or so. Um, originally, we were using online transaction processing systems, and we were just use, doing analysis on operational data. Um, one of the problems with that is we can optimize our database design for reading or for updating. Um, and there are different optimizations. Um, so with a, a transaction processing, it's important for us to record the transactions. So we optimize our transaction databases for updating. That means we have to limit the number of indexes we have in place and the uh, type of uh, optimization, normalization going through third normal form, is really designed to help us efficiently update records. <clears throat> we have a different format that we might follow, a, a star schema, for example, uh, to be more efficient at reading. And of course, we could use a lot more uh, indexing. Um, the first uh, management aids were the managerial information systems, MIS, and that's where we were using uh, operational uh, data. And we actually did, uh, because we realized we were repeating the same queries over and over again, um, we would typically have some mechanism in place that would let us pre-aggregate these more common queries uh, on a a periodic basis so we wouldn't have to bog the machine down using them. Um, then we get into the decision support systems. That's where we use uh, operational data with external data. So then we have to have a data extraction process and integration that populates the decision support system data store. And we have to run those extractions and integrations periodically to make sure we have the most current information. Um, we used relational database uh, management uh, systems to store that information. Then we came up with the um, first generation business intelligence. Um, and uh, that's where we're going to uh, access diverse data sources, filters, aggregations, classifications, um, and we have conflict resolution we have to go through. Um, the data warehouse was still at this point a relational system uh, optimized for query purposes, so it was a separate uh, database server optimized for queries, lots of indexing, and a star schema model. A second generation of business intelligence um, then extended that with a, a cube, which is a multi-dimensional uh, database rather than a two-dimensional that we have in relational. <clears throat> and then the third generation uh, we've extended this into the cloud. And here's a timeline. Um, Forty years ago, uh, late 1970s, uh, we were doing centralized reporting. Then in the 80s with the advent of uh, PCs and uh, software uh, for uh, office uh, automation, uh, we started using spreadsheets. Uh, then enterprise reporting and OLAP in the uh, 90s. Microsoft uh, added OLAP capabilities to its SQL Server database with SQL Server uh, version 7. And then uh, dashboards and the more advanced uh, business intelligence in the uh, 2000s and 2010s. <clears throat> And we see the different uh, categories, uh, things we have to do, and trends uh, that are going on in business intelligence. Um, we've got, uh, as we mentioned uh, at the beginning of the course, 
uh, massive amounts of data, so we have to have data storage improvements. Um, we have these variety of business intelligence appliances that we can apply, lots of libraries we can uh, import into our code uh, to create these appliances. Um, business intelligence is available on the cloud. Then we have big data analytics where we actually can do data analytics on massive data stores. Uh, Spark in, in Databricks are good examples of that. So uh, data analysis tasks are simplified by uh, specialized uh, tools and also by extensions to SQL. And we'll take a look at those uh, shortly. Um, so some of these uh, packages are statistical analysis packages. Uh, they can be interfaced with databases. Um, S++ is a uh, very powerful uh, st uh, statistical analysis package and it has an open source variant called R. Uh, data mining uh, packages, again data mining seeks to discover knowledge automatically uh, in the form of statistical rules and patterns from large databases. And a data warehouse is also something we need and that's uh, something that archives information that has been gathered from multiple sources and stores it under a unified schema at a single site. So the data sources uh, only store current data, not historical data. So what we want to do is store this information, whether it be in a relational database or a uh, cube database, um, we want to store it as historical data. A data warehouse is a repository of information gathered from multiple sources and stored under a unified schema at a uh, single site. So some of the uh, design issues are when and how to gather the data. It can be source driven. Uh, data sources transmit new information to the warehouse either continuously or periodically. Um, we can have it destination driven. The warehouse, on the other end, periodically requests new information from the data sources. Um, but we have to keep the warehouses exactly synchronized with the data sources. So, um, some of the other things. Uh, that are important dimensionality. These are the categories we're going to use to start uh, subtotaling our data. Uh, for example, geographic reason, uh, region might be a dimension. Um, season might be a dimension. A time span, how long ago do we uh, keep our data? Granularity, how far down can we go? Can we go down to the individual transaction level? Or has some aggregation been done? Um, for us. We also have to consider data cleansing. That's correcting mistakes or differences in addresses, uh, merging address lists from multiple sources, purging duplicates, um, and what data to summarize. Raw data may be too large to store online, um, so aggregate values where we roll up a certain number of levels uh, often are what we have to uh, live with. Uh, queries on raw data can be uh, transformed uh, by the query optimizer to use aggregate values. <clears throat> so here's a, a, a comparison of uh, decision support data characteristics um, operational data versus decision support data. Uh, some key points. Decision support data is historic. Um, it has many aggregation levels. It's not normalized. Um, it's queries. Uh, you almost never do updates with it. Um, you have a high level of queries and their uh, queries are going to be um, very complex. Now the schema for our uh, data warehouse 
has to support non-normalized data, complex queries that are being used for reading and not for updating. So that means that we uh, pre-aggregate this information um, so we don't have to do the same calculations over and over again. Um, <clears throat> we uh, mentioned data extraction and loading. This is where we uh, extract the data from our sources, we clean it, and then we load it into our particular system. And then some of the uh, comparisons of data between an operational uh, database and a data warehouse. Um, and you can go through and see that there are some uh, substantial differences. The, the extraction and transformation and loading process is uh, graphically depicted here. We extract data from the operational stores where they're uh, maintained up to the minute. We then do our filtering, picking only the information we're interested in. We transform it from that format, for example, in the demo I did at the beginning of the lecture, I transformed it from XML into SQL, and we were going to store it in a relational database. So I did that transformation. <clears throat> um, did, uh, if we had uh, numbers that we were looking at, we'd do aggregations and summarizations. And then we put that information into our data warehouse. Data marts are uh, single subject subsets in a data warehouse. And they provide uh, decision support to a small group of people. Uh, they can be lower cost to cr create a data mart for uh, a, a team of folks rather than a, a data warehouse. So, there's a set of rules for developing uh, a data warehouse that the authors give here and uh, are, uh, of course, quite widely used in the data warehousing community. A gentleman named Kimball wrote a book on data warehousing that's kind of the Bible of it, and uh, these rules are very consistent with uh, the approach taken by Kimball for uh, preparing data warehouses. <clears throat> A star schema is what we use instead of a normalized schema. So again, it's a data modeling techniques, and it maps multi-dimensional decision support data, in other words, the data we're interested for analytics, into a relational database. So we can store it, and we can read it effectively. So with uh, star schemas, you have facts, which can be numeric representations, um, dimensions, and that's a way you want to summarize or do subtotaling on those facts. Um, attributes, uh, they're what you use to search, filter, and classify. And then you have a hierarchy that shows that you can go from a low level to a higher level. So for example, you can go from uh, sales by state, to sales by region, to sales by country. So <clears throat> facts and dimensions um, are actually physical tables. There's a many-to-one relationship between each fact table and its dimension tables. Uh, so a fact may have a particular key for a customer and then you go read the customer table, you'll get the one exact match. Now many facts may have that same customer key and other customer keys, but they'll go back and you only get one actual customer set of characteristics for that. So the, the primary key of a fact table is a composite key because it's related to many different dimensional tables. So we might think of it as a junction table or an association table uh, in the normalization or the entity relationship modeling approach. So we, instead of doing entity relationship modeling, we would use data warehouse modeling 
uh, to design our databases. So um, a, a snowflake uh, schema is where a dimension table can have its own dimension tables. So you're maintaining multiple fact tables to represent different aggregation levels. And then we have to look at splitting the tables into subsets of rows, replicas, making replications to different locations if appropriate, and then how often we need to periodically update. So we uh, talked about data analytics and gave an example of one. Um, and there's two types of data analytic tools. Uh, well, there's several types. Uh, two of them are explanatory analytics, and that focuses on discovering and explaining uh, data characteristics and relationships. And then predictive analytics folks focuses on predicting future outcomes. And then uh, we have data mining. Again, we're going to be looking at massive amounts of data to uh, look for patterns and hidden relationships. <clears throat> so uh, the processing uh, that we need to do is very low for, in comparison, for um, our operational database. We're just recording the transaction. It's only data. Then information, we take that data and put it into a conceptual framework. That's more processing, and we'll be using data mining and so on. And then with predictive analytics, we take the information and we try to uh, classify or we try to predict based on that. A lot of processing. <clears throat> so uh, in data mining, you're going to have a data preparation phase, data analysis and classification phase, knowledge acquisition phase, and a prognosis phase. And predictive analytics um, creates uh, actionable prediction models based on available data. And we, it can be actually predicting numbers that you might get from a regression analysis, or you can be predicting categories like we did with our classifier for questions about movies coming in. And of course it's going to add value to the organization. So online analytical processing or OLAP is interactive analysis of data and allowing data to be summarized and viewed in different ways in an online fashion with a very small or negligible delay. Um, data that can be modeled as dimensional attributes and measure attributes are called multi-dimensional data. Uh, measure attributes measure some value and they can be aggregated upon. Uh, so for example, the uh, attribute number uh, in the sales relation. Dimensional attributes, on the other hand, define the dimensions or categories on which measures are subtotaled. So we're going to take those measures like sales, and we're going to want to subtotal them by some dimension, as I mentioned, geographic or seasonal, and so on. So. A data cube is a multi-dimensional generalization of a uh, cross-tabulation. Uh, and uh, it's uh, going to be uh, used for storing uh, business intelligence information. And it's going to have the ability to do data aggregation, classification, computing functions, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, an Excel pivot table is a cross-tabulation. So cross-tabulation is also referred to as a pivot table. 
and basically you're doing subtotaling by some dimension. So uh, values for one of the dimension attributes in a uh, multi-dimensional database will form uh, dimension one headers, let's say row headers in a two-dimensional example. Values for another dimension attribute will form uh, dimension two headers, say column attributes in a tabular uh, dimension. Other dimension attributes are listed on top of those and the values in individual cells are aggregates of the values of the subtotals uh, for the dimensional attributes that we specify for each cell. We can also have a hierarchy on dimensional attributes and that lets dimensions be viewed at different levels of detail. So for example, the date time can be used to aggregate by hour of the day, date, day of the week, month, quarter, or year. And cross tabs, uh, another uh, aspect with uh, regards to multidimensionality, can be uh, easily extended to deal with hierarchies, and you can uh, drill down or roll up a hierarchy with that. So, um, of course, uh, business intelligence is going to uh, give you access to many types of databases, uh, flat files, and so on. Databricks is a very powerful example of this that deals with big data, and uh, they let you uh, access a variety of parquet files from Hadoop and various SQL databases that can go right into, and of course, your typical text file, CSV, and so on. Um, and you're going to need support for very large data bases. Um, if you're going to have a good implementation of OLAP, the users have to be able to do their queries they want to in a very friendly manner. Um, and, of course, for the last uh, 25 years, uh, the major vendors like Microsoft and Oracle and IBM have been working on this and have come up with very good uh, user interfaces. So here's the, um, the whole system. We've got, uh, as we talked about before, our extraction, transformation, and loading to a warehouse. <clears throat> then we have our analytical and data processing logic against that data warehouse. And then we have various plugins that we can use so that people can use an Excel type of format, um, a, uh, <clears throat> a, 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 an Ax, Microsoft Access, and so on. So you've got a variety of front end tools that people are familiar with, like spreadsheets or access databases, that they can use to get in and look at the data. And here, instead of um, uh, adding a lot of complexity to our warehouse, we create um, local marts that are of particular interest, customers, uh, production, vendors, and so on. The uh, earliest OLAP systems used multi-dimensional arrays uh, in memory uh, to store the data, and uh, they're referred to as multi-dimensional OLAP or MOLAP systems. Um, then they uh, basically took those multi-dimensional arrays and projected them into two-dimensional space so that they could be put into the tabular format of relational databases. And that became <clears throat> relational ROLAP or uh, uh, relational OLAP or ROLAP. And then finally um, where you'd use both uh, multi-dimensional and ROLAP, and that's hybrid OLAP or HOLAP. Um, data warehousing, the sources uh, often store only current data, not historical data, so we need to uh, you know, keep uh, time as a dimension in what we're doing. Um, 
And corporate decision making uh, requires a unified view of all organizational data, including this historical data. And our warehouse becomes this repository or archive of information gathered from multiple sources. Here we have MOLAP as one of the uh, types of uh, databases, uh, ROLAP versus MOLAP. Um, and then of course the advantages and disadvantages of those and why you might then want to use one or the other. <clears throat> now there's been some extensions to SQL uh, these are not available in SQLite. Um, so uh, obviously going from a 6 gig database like Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server to a 500k database like SQLite, you don't have all of the uh, more complex extensions like rollups and cubes. And these are ways that we can look at data and do uh, aggregations on them. And uh, it's very similar to what we do with group buys. And then we can also uh, create a dynamic table that's a materialized view. In other words, it's a view, but we actually store records in, permanently in the database for the view, and we have to uh, update that uh, periodically. Um, so, uh, that's uh, what we're, we're looking at um, with data warehouses. We're storing uh, this massive amount of uh, integrated data from multiple sources. Uh, dimension values are uh, stored along with the uh, facts that we want to subtotal by. Uh, we use a star schema and uh, for more complicated structures, we might use a snowflake schema. Uh, we use data mining to do predictions such as classification or regression, um, clustering, uh, associations. And we have a training set and a um, <clears throat> testing set with that. Okay, so this concludes the um, lecture on Chapter 13. Thank you.